I like to start off these videos with an elevator pitch for whatever I'm discussing, making the case for why a given class, item, monster, or what have you is a worthy addition to your next Pathfinder experience. But in the case of demons, I feel like my approach differs enough from Paizo orthodoxy that it required an explanation, both of what they tried to accomplish and why I choose a different approach. To that end, I'll be covering the campaign role of demons, tips, and inspirations first, and then going over their general traits before ending by examining specific categories of demons for your players to encounter. But before we start, if you're in need of a Pathfinder 1st Edition Adventure Path, have a look at Sorceress the Dietrich House. Designed for a party of four level 3 characters, this adventure has sinister mysteries, unsolved crimes, and a haunted house with lurking terrors to challenge your players. As well as unexpected treasures, courtesy of the dynamic and thematic loot system, which makes for unique and compelling rewards for parties willing to brave the depths of the Dietrich House. Available right now on DriveThruRPG. Now then, let's begin by looking at two of the biggest influences on the early incarnations of Dungeons & Dragons, and by extension the Pathfinder we know and love. The works of J.R.R. Tolkien and Robert E. Howard, both of which shaped how demons are portrayed and the game role they fill. In that famous scene in Lord of the Rings at the Bridge of Khazad-dûm, when Gandalf the Grey stood before the Balrog, or in the Conan the Barbarian adventure, Phoenix on the Sword, when the Stygian sorcerer Thothamon called on the serpent god Set to unleash a demonic servant on his enemies in Aquilonia. The reputation of demons as amongst the most fearsome and deadly monsters any adventurer will ever face was formed. And that's a sentiment I can full-heartedly agree with. Where I depart is in that I feel that more can and should be done to capture the supernatural and immaterial aspects of demons. As they stand, demons in Pathfinder are very similar to their portrayals in games like Blizzard's Diablo series. Powerful threats, even world-ending, but still in their way, playing by the rules of the material universe. They are presented as a race not unlike orcs, goblins, gnolls, or any other common D&D enemies. They live, in a sense, and can die, in a sense. They have ideas, opinions, prejudices, and can even change their minds and be redeemed, as was the case with the demon queen Nocticula. I feel this makes them less unique, less threatening, and less compelling when implemented in a campaign. Now, let me give a few inspirations that affect the way I present demons in my campaigns. Starting with the Apostles from Berserk. This might appear a strange choice. Apostles are alive. They can be killed, as Guts frequently proves. They have regrets and are very, very human, despite their monstrous forms. But they're not who they were. The sacrifice required by the God Hand to create an Apostle necessitates the loss of something so deeply meaningful to the one making the sacrifice that it, in a spiritual sense, kills who they used to be. The Count may still love his daughter, but that love can't save him. It can't make him any less of a monster. And despite appearances, a very real question can be raised about how much free will apostles actually have. All apostles are servants of causality. Without an overlong digression, causality is the principle of cause and effect that serves the inscrutable will of the idea of evil, the god of the abyss. What that means is that even in rebellion against the god hand, an apostle still serves their master's will. They are, in a sense, enslaved to their own free will. A seeming contradiction that underscores the vast cosmic powers Guts grapples with every time he battles these slaves of darkness. And on that deliberate reference, let's look at my next inspiration, the grim darkness of the 41st millennium, where the most devoted champions of the ruinous powers can achieve the ultimate prize— 
immortality and power beyond mortal comprehension with ascension to daemonhood. And that is, in its way, a fate worse than death. The denizens of the psychic ocean of the immaterium, or warp, as it's often called, are ideas and concepts made manifest in a timeless world of infinite possibility. The four best-known warp entities are the eternally warring embodiments of hope, despair, desire, and hate. These forces, or warp gods, are both single entities and numberless hordes of greater and lesser daemons. A single bloodletter is the smallest fraction of the blood god Corn, and no more capable of wanting anything other than to take skulls and spill blood than a circle is capable of being square. For any mortal to become a daemon of Corn, any part of them that wants anything other than endless carnage must be destroyed, until only corn remains. This also underscores the futility of trying to destroy such creatures with weapons. After all, how can you kill an idea, especially one rooted in the necessity of existence? In these two inspirations, we see some principles I always keep in mind when bringing demons to a campaign. 1. Demons are non-physical. However you choose to explain it, these manifestations of evil energies, this psychic residue of horrible atrocities, these mortal souls reborn by the power of the abyss. Demons are outside the material universe and not subject to its laws. At low levels, when I want to show off a particularly powerful demon, I use haunts, or monsters like swarms or animated objects, to represent a demonic influence on an area. You could also use templates like Demonic Vermin or the Possession Corruption Rules applied to NPCs. Another important feature is demons do not die or reproduce like living creatures. I get a lot of mileage out of the imprisoned demon trope, treating them like supernatural radioactive waste, sending adventurers to Demon Chernobyl to patch holes in an abyssal reactor, I mean prison. On the other end, whatever origins they may have, demons are not born. Hence, one of their most compelling and sinister titles from the Warhammer setting, The Neverborn. This has implications for tieflings. I always attribute their origins to the offspring of cultists, being born near some kind of gateway to the abyss, possession, or dubious gifts from evil-aligned deities. Finally, I find arcane or occult rules governing the behavior of demons reinforces their supernatural qualities. Anathema substances like salt or cold iron being used to create binding circles or to bypass DR, true names giving power over them, or superstitions like an inability to cross running water are great flavor and give your players a lot of cool options. Rule 2. Demons are absolute evil. This principle can be taken very far, depending on how deep you want to dive into the nature of demons. For a relatively uncomplex, rip-and-tear, kill-the-baddies dungeon crawl, treating them like a force of nature will do just fine. A more esoteric plot point might be about what demons can't do, namely, love. Let me clarify, I don't mean desire. Even in the depths of the abyss, demons can feel desire. When I say love, I mean to will the good of the other as other. A succubus has less affection for her victims than a female mantis does for the mate she devours. Finally, drawing parallels with good outsiders like angels and archons who are definitionally good. This is the most challenging campaign use for demons because of the weighty topics it touches on. Is one man's evil really another's good, or is it only wrong when other people do it? Are the good outsiders actually evil for destroying a city of mortals they brand as sinners? Are they indifferent for allowing evil and then claiming that free will demands such actions be allowed? or that simple evil allows for the complex goods of bravery, charity, and mercy? Are demons who allow true freedom to their mortal partisans actually in the right? Or are they genuinely more insightful than their 
good counterparts for doggedly following their own instincts. These trains of thought can go on and on and on, and if you're not careful, crush the fun of killing scary monsters with cool abilities. The final rule of thumb I keep in mind is that demons are cunning. This is a bit of a balancing act. Mindless killing machines doesn't sit right, but neither does schemes within schemes master planners. That's why I use the word cunning over intelligent. Much like the Joker from Dark Knight, do these really look like outsiders with a plan? They're much more opportunistic, watching and waiting for an opportunity, and when the attack comes, it's fast and violent. Part of that is hinging their schemes on more basic human behaviors or events. The classic kidnapping and murdering of a good man's family to turn him to the path of evil. Or, in a structured, orderly society, taking over the body of a high-ranking official and using the lawfully aligned guards to do acts of evil. Or taking control of a group of slavers to acquire large numbers of human sacrifices. The opportunity was there, and the demon took it. Or, to paraphrase Gordon Gecko from Wall Street, I wrecked it because it was wreckable. Now that I've given my three rules of thumb when utilizing demons in a campaign, let's look at demons as a group in Pathfinder 1E before examining some of the category's individual members. In Pathfinder 1st Edition, demons are chaotic evil outsiders from the abyss. They have resistance to acid, cold, and fire, as well as immunity to electricity and poison. Finally, demons are treated as chaotic and evil for the purposes of damage reduction. Alright, now let's look at individual demons. Starting with the lowest, the Dretch. These are the weakest and most pathetic of demon kind. They have low hitting power with 1 d4 plus 1 claws and a bite. But with their damage reduction, they're surprisingly survivable and difficult to destroy. They also have some debuffing capacity, with spell-like abilities like Fear and Stink Cloud. Also, like all demons, they have the ability to summon yet more demons. Dretches are available as they summon themselves, with Summon Monster 3. Low-level parties can expend a lot of energy killing Dretches, and they remain troublesome to deal with for characters that inflict ranged damage, even into mid-levels because of their damage reduction and resistances. Next, we have Quasits. These are the demon equivalents of Diabolic Imps. Their DR and resistances give them some survivability. They're very mobile, with a fly speed of 50 feet with perfect maneuverability. Additionally, they have some spell-like abilities that are very useful. They can at will detect good, detect magic, and most importantly, become invisible. One time per day, they can cause fear, and one time per week, they can cast Commune. Quasits do their best work as thieves and spies, usually in the service of a spellcaster as a familiar. Also, their ability to cast Commune is frequently utilized to get in contact with more powerful denizens of the Abyss. Now, on to Baboos. These are the murderous shock troops of the Abyss as well as the archetypal Red Demon. They're very akin to Cornate Bloodletters, so if you're looking for some cool miniatures for your baboos, that's a great place to go. Now, when demons are involved, feel free to field baboos often and in large numbers. They have damage resistance 10, bypassed by cold iron and good. They have standard demonic resistances and spell resistance 17. Additionally, they have a feature called Protective Slime. Baboos are covered in acidic slime. Anyone inflicting an unarmed or natural attack against a baboo must make a DC 18 reflex save or take 1d8 points of acid damage. Melee weapons also take acid damage and might be broken if the acid eats through its hardness. Baboos come armed with their claws and long spears. However, don't feel the need to marry that weapon choice. You can give them all kinds of things, like swords or axes. Another feature they have is Sneak Attack. They deal an additional 2d6 points of damage 
if sneak attack conditions are met. Baboos have a plus 22 to stealth and are fond of ambushing their victims. And of course, they're very dangerous in groups where they can give each other flanking for bonus damage. And if that wasn't enough, they have spell-like abilities, such as teleport. Most demons at higher CRs have the ability to teleport, and flavoring their teleportation as them phasing in and out of reality really reinforces their supernatural qualities. Baboos also have Dispel Magic as an at-will spell-like ability. This makes them amazing anti-mage units. They can also cast Darkness and have Dark Vision. Even powerful spellcasters will find them to be a challenge. On top of their innate resistances, their SR and ability to cast Dispel Magic make them a lot to handle. Now on to the spooky ones, Shadow Demons. Shadow Demons have DR10, Resistance 10 to Acid and Fire, as well as Immunity to Cold, Electricity, and Poison. They have Spell Resistance 17, and if that wasn't enough, they are Incorporeal. Shadow Demons can move very quickly. They can fly at 40 feet per round and one time per minute, can sprint at a speed of 240 feet for one round. They have okay damage output. They have two claws that hit on touch that deal 1d6 points of damage plus 1d6 cold damage and a bite that deals 1d8 damage plus 1d6 cold damage. Where Shadow Demons really impress is with their spell-like abilities. At will, they can cast Deeper Darkness, Fear, Greater Teleport, and three times per day, Shadow Conjuration or Shadow Evocation. Think of Shadow Demons as your go-to demon wizard ghost, capable of calling nightmares from the very darkness itself. Also, Shadow Demons have an ability called Shadow Blend. In any condition other than Bright Light, as a move equivalent action. Shadow demons can become invisible. Artificial illumination and spells that create light below third level do not negate this ability. Now, of course, shadow demons have sunlight powerlessness. In bright light, shadow demons can take only a standard action or a move action. This also affects another important spell-like ability it has, the ability to cast Magic Jar to possess victims. It can do this one time per day. Now, it can remain inside a victim and continue to possess them even in bright light. However, if that victim is harmed by light, created by spells like Sunbeam or Sunburst, the Magic Jar effect immediately ends. Shadow Demons also have some interesting knowledge skills. They have bonuses in Knowledge Local and Knowledge Planes. They really get around. Our next type of demon is Hezro. These are big fat toad demons. And they have a nice primordial feel to them. They have average defenses, DR10, resistance 10 to acid, cold, and fire, and immunity to electricity and poison. As well as spell resistance 22. But they have a comparatively massive health pool for their CR at 145 points. When it comes to damage, Hezros are heavy hitters, with offensive spell-like abilities like Chaos Hammer and Unholy Blight for good targets. They're also no slouch in melee combat, with a bite attack that deals 4d4 plus 8 and grab, as well as claws that deal 1d8 plus 8 and grab. Once they've grabbed a victim, it gets even worse because they have an ability called Nausea. In order to clear this effect, the nauseated creature must succeed at a DC 24 fortitude save. Or remain nauseated for one minute and not grappled by the Hezro. In addition to their damage dealing ones, they have additional spell-like abilities such as Greater Teleport. They can use this at will. Gaseous Form, usable three times per day and Blasphemy, which can kill or weaken weaker creatures. They can do this one time per day. Hezros are surprisingly intelligent. They get a plus 15 bonus to Knowledge Arcane and plus 15 to Spellcraft checks. An additional interesting point. Hezros that have been summoned, like offerings of potions or poisons, worth at least 500 gold pieces. 
Finally, they like dwelling in dismal backwaters and swamps where their influence can warp and mutate the local inhabitants, wildlife, and environment. Next, we have the net weavers, tempters, and great deceivers of demon kind, the Glabrazoo. These guys have DR10, bypassed by good only. Resistance 10 to fire, acid, and cold. They are immune to electricity and poison, and have spell resistance 24. Offensively, they have two deadly pincers that deal 2d8 plus 10 damage, two claws that deal 1d6 plus 10 damage, and a bite for 1d8 plus 10. They have spell-like abilities such as Chaos Hammer and Unholy Blight. Now let's talk about their signature spell-like ability, Veil. A Glabrazoo can assume the form of almost anything, and the illusion looks and feels quite real. And if that wasn't enough, it has still more spell-like abilities, such as Dispel Magic, Mirror Image, Reverse Gravity, Greater Teleport, and Power Word Stun. Finally, its greatest ability, the ability to cast Wish one time per month. A Glabrazoo can grant a mortal humanoid a wish. The wish is granted in the most painful and twisted way possible that's guaranteed to end badly, such as raising a dead loved one as a vampire or something like that. Monkey's paw type of stuff. There is, however, a way that they will grant wishes in the spirit that they're asked, if one of three side effects is implemented. The first is psychosis. The wisher becomes chaotic evil and a psychopath. Most players will not go for that one. Option number two, the wisher is cursed. This functions as the bestow curse spell cast at ninth level. Finally, option three, the one you should push your players to go for if they've somehow managed to wrangle a wish from a glabrazoo. The mark of treachery. An abyssal brand appears upon the wisher. From then on, the Glabrazoo can perceive the world through the creature's senses and contact them telepathically. The Glabrazoo can request one service of the Wisher. If the service is accepted and completed, the mark fades away. If the service is refused, the Glabrazoo can cast Destruction for 10d6 damage and ask again one minute later. Only a Miracle and a DC 30 caster level check can remove the mark. Glabrazoo have a plus 22 bonus to their knowledge history, because they were there, and a plus 18 knowledge local. Glabrazoo tend to act as information brokers and love offerings of dark secrets. Come to think of it, they're very similar to the Keepers of Secrets from the Warhammer franchise, down to the multiple crustacean-like claws. Now, let's move on to the Sages and Scholars of the Abyss. Those who keep the darkest and most profane of lores, the Nalfeshi. They have DR10 bypassed by good. Resistance 10 to fire, acid, and cold, as well as immunity to electricity and poison, and spell resistance 25. These giant pig monsters are equipped with tiny raven wings that allow them to fly at 40 feet per round with poor maneuverability and a possibility of killing adventurers with laughter. That's not the only way they can kill adventurers, though. They have a massive bite attack for 3d8 plus 11 damage. Two claws that do 2d6 plus 11, call lightning as a spell-like ability, and the awesome blow feet. Now, Feshi have an unholy aura. Good creatures that make a melee strike against them must succeed at a fortitude save or take 1d6 points of strength damage. They also have an ability called Unholy Nimbus. As a free action, all non-demon creatures within 60 feet must make a DC 22 will save or be dazzled for 1d10 rounds. Additionally, they have very impressive knowledge skills. A plus 23 to Arcane, plus 23 to Knowledge Planes, and two additional knowledges get a plus 20 bonus. And as you'd expect, Nalfeshi like to bargain and trade for knowledge, although a more arcane and esoteric sort than the Glabrazoo like. 
All right. Now let's look at the one, the only, the true demons of might that lay to waste all before them, creatures of shadow and flame, the Baylor. A Baylor has DR 15 bypassed by cold iron and good, resistance 10 to acid and cold, immunity to electricity, fire and poison, and spell resistance 31. The Baylor has an unholy aura. Fort save for good creatures in melee or 1d6 strength damage. They also have flaming body. Unarmed or natural attacks inflicted on the Baylor deal 1d6 points of fire damage to an attacker. Grappled creatures take 6d6 points of fire damage. Baylor have wings and can fly at 90 feet with good maneuverability. In combat, a Baylor gets four attacks with its plus one unholy Vorpal Longsword for 2d6 plus 13 damage, or three attacks with their Vorpal Flaming Whip. When fighting these guys, there is a 1 in 20 chance of insta-death, and that dice is rolled an awful lot. Now, of course, they have spell-like abilities, such as Blasphemy, Firestorm, Implosion, and telekinesis. They can also cast Dispel Magic and Dominate Monster at will. Also, Greater Teleport. Now, if your players somehow manage to destroy a Baylor, everything within 100 feet takes 50 points of fire and 50 points of unholy damage, reflex 33 to half. And I'm sure wherever a Baylor explodes remains burnt, charred, and on fire for ever after. Now let's see, was that all of the demons that I was going to cover? Am I missing something? Oh yeah, that one. Let's talk about succubi. If you're wondering why I waited till the very end to cover them, you've learned the first lesson of running succubi in your campaign. Never give it up until the bitter end. Now there's a quote from C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters I keep in mind whenever I bring a succubus to a campaign. All the healthy and outgoing activities we want them to avoid can be inhibited and nothing given in return. When it comes to succubi, nothing given in return is the idea. Rather than sensual indulgence, focus on temptation, addiction, and consequences. A succubus is there to create and facilitate human misery, not fulfill human desires. There are two possible starts to any encounter with a succubus. Either the player is aware that they're dealing with a demon, or they don't know what they have on their hands. This is where knowing your players and their characters will help you come to the decision on which one of these approaches is best. If you have a party who's edgy, open-minded, or a little weird, you can get good results from being out loud and proud about the temptations of their infernal Venus. However, if you have a more straight-laced or suspicious party, the thrill of unmasking the she-devil, a she-demon, might serve them better. Another rule to keep in mind, a succubus should never be alone. They are social creatures. And in mechanical terms, not built for direct combat. She should always have armed mortal admirers, helpless mind-controlled human shields, charmed monsters, or other demons close by. Also, a word on incubi. Fundamentally, they're identical to their sisters, but they're well used as a peril for PC's loved ones. Wives, fiancés, even mothers can fall under the sway of these handsome devils, or demons. Succubi have DR-10 bypassed by cold, iron, or good. Resistance 10 to acid and cold, as well as immunity to electricity, fire, and poison. Finally, spell resistance 18. Succubi are quick. They can fly at 50 feet. And they have an ability called Alter Self. A succubus can assume and maintain the appearance of a small or medium humanoid almost indefinitely. This makes them very good for scouting, spying, and it can also help them escape. They are constantly under the effects of Detect Good and Tongues. Now let's talk about the Succubi's most potent weapons. Spell-like abilities such as Charm Monster, usable at will. 
This allows for the ensorceling of town guards and monsters with ease. They also have suggestion. This is good for isolating victims. Commands like follow me or tell your friends you're going to bed are easily fulfilled. Finally, they have Dominate Person. This is usable one time per day and lasts for 12 days. A succubus can maintain a party of pet adventurers or a few powerful nobles without breaking a sweat. Now on to their Energy Drain ability. A succubi can drain the energy from mortals lured into acts of passion, such as a kiss. The succubi bestows one negative level and a suggestion Typically, she'll ask for another kiss. Now, it's not all bad. Well, it is all bad, but mechanically speaking, there can be some benefits to a succubi's affections, such as the profane gift. A succubi's most favored or most easily manipulated victims uh, can be granted a plus two profane bonus to any ability score. This also comes with a telepathic link, to the demon through which she can use her suggestion ability. Now that's the vanilla version. A succubi can also give a number of other boons, such as the gift of transformation, allowing the victim to use her shape change ability at will. This does weaken the victim's resistance to her suggestion ability. They take a negative four penalty on will saves. One of her better boons, and the most cooperative, is the Gift of Dominance. This allows the succubus to use Dominate Person through the gifted individual as if they were the source of the spell. If this is done, the recipient of the gift gets an additional plus two profane bonus to an ability score. The final profane gift these temptresses have to offer is the Gift of Recovery. One time per day, when the gifted fails, a will save they can immediately try again using the succubis will save. Thank you very much for watching this D6 damage guide to demons in Pathfinder 1E. If you'd like to support my work outside of YouTube, check out Sorceress the Dietrich House, available right now on DriveThruRPG. And if you'd like more Pathfinder 1E content, follow me on either YouTube or BitChute. Finally, if you'd like to take your game further, Check out the D6 Damage Discord, where we have great discussions about all aspects of Pathfinder, game mastering, character builds, and much, much more. The link is in the description.